Um, welcome to those of you who are watching. Um, tonight is our Charlotte City Council February 1st um, meeting. This meeting is um, being held in as, as a virtual meeting in accordance with the electronic meeting standards and all of the requirements in those standards have been met. I hope that um, many of you are tuned in and you watching either on the government channel, the city's Facebook page or the YouTube page that we have. And so thank you for joining us tonight for our strategy session. This is a meeting where the council has the opportunity to um, review the work from the committees and to um, help each other formulate the policies and recommendations from the various council committees. And we'll have that first on the agenda tonight. So let me please um, first introduce the members of the Charlotte City Council. I am Vi Wiles and I serve as mayor. Julie Eisel, Mayor Pro Tem and serving at large. Dimple Ashmira at large. Braxton Winston at large. Clark Eggleston, District 1. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Victoria Watlington, District 3. Renee Johnson, District 4. Matt Newton, District 5. A joyous Monday to you all, Tark Wakari, District 6. Good evening, Ed Driggs, District 7. Thank you very much. We also have um, members of our staff here, and I'd like to start with our city clerk for introductions. Stephanie Kelly, city clerk. Lena James, deputy city attorney. Marcus Jones, city manager. Kay Cunningham, mayor's office. Donata Jackson, office of constituent services. Patrick Baker, city attorney. And we have additional staff um, that work with us as we go into this. Um, we have modified our agenda tonight so that we can address um, two specific areas for council discussion. The first one being the city council committee chair updates where um, we ask the, council, the committee chairs to ask the council or inform the council of what they're doing and ask what significant feedback they would have in any of those given areas. And we have six committees and we'll go through that. And then the second um, item on our agenda is the f um, action to um, appoint or nominate and vote to fill the current at-large city council vacancy um, for tonight. So I'm going to start with our committees and I'm going to open it up with our budget and effectiveness committee. I read the materials and I see that we have a number of efforts going on in that committee. And so, Mr. Driggs. Yes, good evening, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to point out the members of the committee, aside from myself as chair, our Mayor Pro Tem Isolt as vice chair, and council members Asmira, Graham, and Johnson. Um, you have a, a full written report, so I'd just like to highlight a few items. Uh, want to refer again to our financial audit uh, which was uh, squeaky clean. It was an exceptionally uh, complimentary report from our auditor. Congratulations once again to our CFO and her staff for achieving that result during the uh, COVID virus. Uh, one of the items the committee considered was the ethics policy. Uh, we continued to work on uh, some changes that we had already uh, identified to refine the language that was proposed in order to clarify certain things. But the essence of the proposed change is that for one, council members will be under a burden to communicate with the city attorney if there is any issue about which they have a concern that there could be a perception or an actual ethics violation. And they will be bound to take the advice of the city attorney on what they should do individually about that. In the case of uh, complaints being filed, uh, the main difference is that the city attorney, in addition to reviewing the complaint to see if it meets the filing requirements, the technical filing requirements, can also make a prima facie determination about the validity of the complaint. So prima facie meaning this is a, an initial review that seeks to establish whether or not the complaint as submitted, if true and so on, has substance. And the effect of that is that we're not sending every single thing that comes in to somebody outside uh, right away. The, uh, <clears throat> our goal here is to have the city attorney make a presentation on the proposed changes at a future council meeting in the near future uh, so that the full council consider the recommendations 
and uh, we could finally adopt a permanent change. Uh, we also considered, again, the Citizens Advisory Committee on Governance Recommendations. And I will say there, we kind of went down a list and we identified which items we felt were actionable. Uh, so as you know, we've already reported that the committee did not recommend pursuing term limits because of constitutional issues. But we also, after conversation, felt that uh, because we're not going to have the results of the census until so this, the summer sometime, it appears at the earliest, that we should not take up the redistricting question yet. We should do so in the context of knowing the data from that. Um, we felt that we would consider the compensation question during the budget process. So that will come up. And uh, looking at all the items that were uh, recommended, the one that uh, struck us as requiring immediate council action, if we intend to act, was the question of the four-year terms. So the recommendation of the committee to the full council is that uh, we decide quickly whether or not that is something you want to pursue. And if so, uh, take the necessary steps, which I, I think you'll recall have been explained to us as a sort of timeline of things that we would have to do, a question about a referendum and so on. But uh, if that's something the council wants to do, then uh, we should get on with it. The other topic we considered was virtual meeting provisions. And the reason this is a topic is because virtual meetings that take place after <clears throat> the pandemic, after the state of emergency is lifted, uh, take, uh, occur in a very different legal environment and have different implications compared to the meetings that we're holding now under the pandemic. Uh, the, the action that we took last October to make unlimited participation, virtual participation in meetings possible um, did not really recognize that distinction and extends past the end of the pandemic. So after a lot of discussion in committee, we decided that it wasn't necessary for us to resolve what we would do about virtual meetings, what would be allowed, what wouldn't be allowed, how it would work, and, and what the laws are that would apply. But we did feel uh, by a three to two majority, a split decision, that we should amend the action that we took in October so that it sunsets uh, at the end of the emergency period and as it stands now, that would give us months to have a conversation about how virtual meetings will work after the pandemic period. Um, but this loose end where we currently have a rule that allows for virtual meetings without any reference to the special circumstances that uh, take effect again after the pandemic uh, is something that we ought to clean up. Uh, the last thing that we talked about was the February budget workshop agenda. And the, uh, the first meeting is day after tomorrow. And at that meeting, basically, we will go over some basics of the current situation in our uh, general fund. We'll talk about bonds and things like that, some of the debt, and basically lay a foundation for our subsequent conversations uh, about the budget. Uh, the key thing this year is that we have uh, two bond cycles for which we need to decide on CIP projects. They are currently... Uh, unprogrammed, and uh, in, in this budget process, we will have to decide on projects that will be funded during the next two bond cycles. Um, so the committee was, uh, gave positive feedback on that, and, and I think everybody will find that it's a constructive meeting. And Madam Mayor, that's my report. can't hear the mayor. If, uh... Mayor, I, I think you're muted. Okay, excuse me. Thank you. I was just saying your committee has been doing a lot of good work. And what I heard you say is that the ethics policy will be coming up at a council meeting in the near future, that the vote on four-year terms needs to come before the council as well with a schedule for that. And that should be on a council meeting. And then I also heard you say that the um, recommendation on um, the sunset needs to have a council vote as well. So with that, um, I guess the real question I saw in the report, it says, um, are, they, is, are the council, is the committee report in line 
with the council members' general thoughts to move forward. So any questions for the committee chair and, um, and the next steps as they've outlined them. Um, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Can, can everyone hear me? No. Can you speak up a little bit more? Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can everyone hear me better now? That's better me? now. Is that, is that better now? Yeah, so, uh, so thank you for that report, Mr. Driggs. I appreciate all the committee's hard work. Uh, I had a question pertaining to the, the sunset provision for virtual meetings. And I guess I'm just wondering why uh, that is topic of conversation right now. Uh, we don't know when any guidelines are gonna be lifted. Frankly, it's my understanding that there are new strains of the, uh, of the uh, coronavirus. Uh, that, that are out there that are, are making uh, that determination even more complicated. And I'm wondering, seeing as how we don't know when that's going to happen, uh, there could be the real likelihood or possibility that we could be placing a restriction on a future council. And why wouldn't we just wait for them to make a decision themselves when the time arose? Uh, the, the point of the action we took was simply to avoid the situation where we had in place an ordinance or a resolution, an, an intention uh, that extended into the period after the end of the pandemic and did not take into account the provisions that will become effective again when the pandemic ends. We need to be more thoughtful about that. So the only thing this does, it says that we will, uh, at a future date, as the end of the pandemic becomes more visible, we will take up the subject of virtual meetings post-pandemic and we will be thoughtful about the rules that would apply to those or there's some practical considerations that would apply to those and that we would adopt a, a more differentiated policy about them uh, rather than what happened, which was that we just looked at the virtually unrestricted virtual meetings that we have during the pandemic and projected that past the end of it. So the sunset provision does nothing other that take away the suggestion that we intend to continue to operate as if pandemic conditions exist after when they don't exist anymore, does not in any way limit our ability to study and be thoughtful about how virtual meetings will work after the pandemic. Uh, and that was the majority recommendation of the committee to the full council that we simply clarify it is not our intention to continue to operate as if there were uh, emergency pandemic conditions when there aren't anymore. And I understand that. I, I, I guess I, I hear it and, and what I'm hearing is, is that we'll be taking this up at a later date. Uh, that's what, you know, what we are giving the affirmative intention for right now. And it just seems redundant because that's what would happen anyway. Um, but anyhow, uh, you know, that's my two cents on it. And it sounds like it's something that will come before the council for a vote at some point. Uh, and I'll be looking forward to that discussion and conversation. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Are there any other questions for the budget and effectiveness committee? All right, hearing none. Um, the next committee that we're gonna hear from is Great Neighborhoods. Mr. Graham. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. Um, the Great Neighborhood Committee, um, uh, the committee members are uh, Council Member Winston, uh, Bakari, Iso, and Wallington. Um, you have the report in front of you, so I will not be redundant in terms of reading it all. Uh, the committee last met on January 20th. All the committee members were in, in attendance. Uh, we took on three items. One uh, was the Legacy Commission report. Uh, we received and reviewed the staff nation and made a motion to uh, move forward with um, renaming uh, a pilot case where we would um, re re rename a street name. One of the things that the council or the committee wanted to do was to kind of uh, move forward on the recommendations from the task force and try to identify a pilot case where we would actually go through uh, and try to rename um, one of our city's name um, based on the criteria and recommendation from the the committee itself. So that will be coming to the full council for your for your consideration as well. Uh, in addition, we talked uh, about source of income discrimination, made a number of recommendations that we will be forwarding to the full council. The most important thing is that on February 8th, um, the staff will be there to make a presentation, uh, a very detailed presentation that will put all of the recommendations that you see in front of you in perspective. And so again, 
that would be a very important meeting for the field council so that we all can have the same information at the same time and begin to make some um, decisions along the way. Again, that presentation is on February 8th. Uh, lastly, um, we had a really good presentation from staff, uh, Mr. Manager, relating to the 20 20 year review, where we really just kind of took some time and reflect upon the work that the committee has done last year, uh, going all the way back to the housing COVID-19 task force and the results that came from that particular work group, as well as all the other initiatives that the council as a whole approved uh, relating to uh, housing. We have a great story to tell based on the results. Obviously, there's still more work to do, uh, and we acknowledge that as well. But we just wanted to make sure that um, we communicate directly to the public about all we have done and what all the public has done from uh, the um, approval of the $50 million bond in November for additional affordable housing, about the success with the housing trust funds uh, in reference to the 10 projects that we passed in, uh, in April, um, the monies that we put aside for, for Brook Hill, uh, from all the efforts that we made in reference to our CARES dollars, mortgage relief, um, rent relief, utilities, et cetera. We, we got a really great story to tell. Uh, and we also talked about, Mr. Manager, about ways that we communicate that out to the public um, because there's still a notion um, that we as a city is not doing anything for housing, quote, unquote. Uh, and so there has to be a way for us to really communicate outwardly in terms of what we're doing um, demonstrating the fact that there's still more work uh, to be done. Uh, that's my report, Madam Mayor. All right. I'm really, um, again, two great efforts, Legacy Commission and the source of income discrimination coming out of the committee. So I believe that the um, questions are um, on the report, basically. Are there any questions prior to um, you're reading or re after reading the um, report from the committee, anything that you'd like to um, inquire or point out as a priority for you before this, these items come before the council as a whole. I have Mr. Newton. Madam Mayor, my hand was still up. Sorry about that. That's okay. It happens, right? Fine. Yes, um, anyone else? Ms. DeGram, okay, thank you very much. So our next committee um, report is Intergovernmental Relations. Mr. Bakari and Mr. Winston. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll give it real quick. This will be relatively short uh, report out. Uh, we had a meeting in January uh, where we were presented to by staff about the city's participation uh, in, in the North Carolina Utilities Commission on deliberation of Duke Energy's Integrated uh, Resource Plan. Um, I, I will also say, you know, where we are in time, um, if any uh, council members, uh, we're finalizing our legislative agenda for our federal delegation. Um, obviously, things have changed uh, since we adopted it. Um, and again, we always know that this is a fluid process. So as we kind of move forward, this is something that uh, Mr. Bakari and I just asked you guys to keep an eye on. Um, and reach out to us if there's anything that you want to talk about in regards to that. Thank you. All right. Any questions for the intergovernmental team? Hearing no questions, we'll move to safe communities. But, Mr. Eggleston, do you mind if I do something in advance of that? Whatever you'd like. Thank you. This is important because I'm going to give you more work to do. Um, uh, yeah, I'm to talk about that referral. Uh, okay, so I am um, giving a referral to the safe community. Um, basically, the city's received a request for support in the establishment of a family justice center in Mecklenburg County. It follows a national cent victim centered traumatic informed model in which domestic abuse, uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, elder abuse, and human trafficking and child abuse partners co locate and work in collaboration for services. And so we have a question of how it partnering in the establishment of the Family Justice Center advanced the city's violence prevention efforts. And I've referred this to the Safe Communities Committee. And I believe you have a meeting tomorrow. Um, Mr. Well, Eggleston. You've just stolen my entire update. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. I just didn't know if council members read those referrals when they go out. 
Uh, hopefully the chairs of committees read referrals that you send to their committees, yes. Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But, yeah, so you pretty much encapsulated it. People can uh, join us tomorrow at noon for the Safe Communities Committee meeting, and the main topic uh, is going to be the referral of the Family Justice Center um, and all of the other things that the mayor just said. So that is literally the report. Join us tomorrow. All right, questions for Safe Communities. All right, hearing no questions, the next committee referral that we have is Transportation Planning and Environment. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the committee met twice in January, uh, just given the volume of work that we have. And the committee members are Larkin Eggleston, Ed Driggs, Matt Newton, and Braxton Winston. On January 6th, we had an update on the Charlotte Moves uh, task force work as they submitted their official report um, in December and then had a public hearing on the report in January 4th before the council. Um, the, those who are following the report know that the task force recommended to invest in mobility to meet the changing needs and set out what that would look like to align the mobility investment with related initiatives and that those being other plans that the council has passed in, in the past and then commit resources to achieve a particular vision for our multimodal transport, uh, uh, transit plan, that including the transit plans that have been pay, passed by other towns. Um, the committee recommendation to the city manager was four to one with Mr. Driggs being opposed to direct the city manager to proceed with a strategy for a legislative process to refine a funding strategy and develop a financing plan as defined by the Charlotte Moon's task force with the participation of legislators, government entities, and other potential stakeholders. We then met again on January 25th, and in that meeting, we had a presentation from CATS on CATS Tracks, T-R-A-X, and what that is, is it's a, um, it is a, a system to review, to capture performance data and measures that look at the operational um, performance of CATS with regards to customer service, financial stewardship, employee engagement in the community. And they reported very good outcomes um, for the most part on those, on those data measures. Um, we had an update on the Silver Line. The Silver Line is at the beginning of the pre-project development and that's important because that's the phase before entering the, fe the formal federal pipeline, which is um, basically where we get in line hopefully for federal funding. Um, and that happens once we finish the alignment and stat, uh, stations and identify where those are gonna go. And that's what's going on right now really is there's, there's been a lot of public engagement to talk to of the, the four focus areas that are within the silver line that are within city limits. Uh, there are dates set out to be able to talk to um, residents in Charlotte and then another couple dates for the two segments outside of Charlotte so that people can give input on um, the system alignment and where the proposed alignment is gonna be. And those, I believe, are all on the CATS website. They're all coming up in February with one in March on the six different focus areas, and those will be at 5.30 p.m. on the government channel. Um, the next step then would be to publicly review the recommendations of the alignment of the Silver Line. That will take place January through March, um, and that will happen through community meetings as well. Uh, we received an update on the comprehensive vision plan. The committee received the overview of the public engagement that's taking place. And I have to give them all a lot of credit because between Charlotte Moves, between um, the Silver Line, between comprehensive vision plan, both transit and planning have been doing a lot of work to engage the public on that. So we appreciate that. Um, there's still opportunity for them to continue public engagement and they're on the, on the, you can either go to the cltfuture2040plan.com or CLT, and you can email comments at cltfuture2040 at charlottenc.gov um, to, to continue to give uh, comments on that, <clears throat> on the plan. Staff is also currently working on a dashboard for all of those comments to provide feedback and anyone can be able to view what people have had to say about that. 
And, and then in March, we'll make a recommendation um, to request approval based on the recommended, recommended changes to the document. And in April, we'll request action for approval of the document and council adoption of the comprehensive plan. So that's coming up soon. And I really encourage everybody to go onto the website and take a look at where we are, perhaps to join some of those meetings in February so that you can not only come up to speed on where the plan is, but also get um, feedback from the community, because as we know, that's kind of difficult to do right now. So um, that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. Everybody has the, um, the outline of more detail on what uh, those initiatives, where we are with that. All right, thank you. Um, I, I have to say this is a lot of good work and when I look at this, this is the work that's gonna serve 10, 15, 20 years out. So I know that sometimes we have things that we can do immediately, but this work is the kind of work that is future forward and um, really appreciate what's being done. Um, I, are there questions? Policy questions, issues, is there something missing, something that you wanna to add to um, transportation planning and environment? Anything? Um, any council members? Comments? No. All right, thank you very much. So our last committee is going to, the report's gonna be done by um, Mr. Bakari, who is the vice chair of our Workforce and Business Development Committee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The Workforce and Business Development Committee is, is comprised of Malcolm Graham, Renee Johnson, and Dimple Ajmera. And I shall also not read the update. We can all read on our own. I just will mention more at a strategic level. Um, staff is really doing a lot of work right now um, on these fronts. And while there are a lot of little things that are being worked on, um, I really view our work in 2021 in two major buckets. One of which is continued kind of post COVID economic recovery for our community. And the other is this glue that's going to hopefully be the, 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 the force that binds a lot of our other work together across all of council topics, and that's the strategic employment plan. So um, as you think about various topics, um, every one of you colleagues um, across the community, as you hear small businesses and workforce issues and opportunities, please bring those to our committee and to staff um, because this is going to be a very significant undertaking as we look of kind of, you know, triaging and stopping the bleeding in 2020 into re jump starting the economic engine of Charlotte. So it's going to be a ton of work, and this isn't going to be a committee's work or even a staff's work. It's going to be our entire body working together as a team. So as you have ideas or see issues or, or opportunities we can move upon, please do bring that to the entire committee and to staff so that we can piece that together. And I do believe that is directly related to that second item, the strategic uh, employment plan. You've heard Ms. Dodson talk about it several times. The staff is really putting all of their effort into that. And, and the punchline there is, um, whether it's deciding where we're going to focus on affordable housing or transportation solutions or uh, anything else you can imagine, uh, understanding the makeup, the, 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 the limitations and the opportunities and where we're heading around employment, around jobs in those areas is truly, um, uh, it really has the potential to be uh, evolutionary for us as a community. So I think this is probably the most strategic work that this group who has a lot of big wins under their belt have, has undertaken to date. And I think it's gonna be a really important year. So as you're working again across the community and in your various verticals in your committees, whether it's housing or transportation or budget, um, be, be thinking about angles where the connection points can be identified and implemented with the strategic employment plan. Any questions? So I have, I have a comment, if that's okay. Um, I just want to recognize that Mr. Winston and I have, you said, Mr. Bakari, focus on what you can imagine, that Mr. Winston and I are not imagining this. This is a very real idea that we begin to look at Charlotte in the, in the light of being able to be a um, production city 
for um, creative arts, for television, um, for all of those things that we perhaps think that, well, we missed a chance once the film credits began to move. I think that Mr. Winston has been doing a yeoman's job trying to get a really good understanding of that. And I would hope that that would be, um, when we talk about all programs from transit to housing, that we look at culture as well. So I wanted to just add that to the list. Yes, and I might add, it, it's a beautiful example, not only of a critical element of the arts conversation that we're, we're undertaking right now, but also just a great example of the power of the strategic employment plan that staff is working on, where it's not just about going and trying to revitalize that industry that was booming at one point in time in our region and has been lost and now is, is, is poised for a comeback, but it's about identifying parts of town and knowing when we're making transit decisions or when we're making housing decisions how it correlates to that particular workforce and employment um, focus. So I think that's a great example. So thank you. Any other questions? I, he I have no, hand no other comments by the council members. So that is the end of our um, committee report agenda item for our first, for this, uh, this afternoon's strategy session. So we'll move to our next um, item on our agenda, which is consideration of the city council's vacancy. Today, the council will nominate and vote to fill the current at-large city council vacancy vac that was once held by um, former Democratic council member James Mitchell. Last Friday, we held a very successful public forum and heard from some outstanding candidates. 68 people spoke with us and participation in that forum, while it was optional, we got lots of emails, lots of videos sent and it was really amazing to have people um, really come in and say, I think that the, the past presidential election made people very much aware of their ability to influence and impact um, what government does. And, and this is, I believe, a part of the result that we're seeing here in our own community. So I just wanted to um, do a reminder for the public that eligible candidates had to meet the following criteria. You had to be registered as a Democrat. You had to be registered as a voter. You had to be 21 years of age or older, a resident of the city of Charlotte, and be qualified to vote in a city council election. So with that, I'm going to open it up and I'm going to ask the city attorney to provide us an overview of the procedural and legal implications of our discussion. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, you're on mute. Can he hear that I asked him to do that? Heard that, and I'm about that. Uh, thank you again, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, and in looking at, at how uh, you have, uh, you, the past city councils have handled uh, the process of filling vacancies, we've tried to stay in line uh, with that as we present this to you. Um, essentially, uh, there's a nomination period, and this is what I've recommended in the um, memo that I provided to you on January the 15th, uh, where you will nominate uh, a, a, a candidate, and uh, after the uh, mayor opens uh, the nomination process, you'll make nominations uh, at some point in time that uh, nomination process will be closed uh, and you'll vote on those nominees. Uh, the, the purpose of that vote is to uh, either get to six votes. If uh, there are six votes, then uh, that, that individual uh, is the um, is the appointed, uh, will be appointed to, uh, to uh, the vacancy that you have here. Assuming that there aren't six votes, uh, what's been done is to uh, identify the top two vote getters. And, uh, and in, uh, with your boards and commissions, I believe you uh, essentially take out the nominees who don't get uh, at least uh, two votes or two votes or less are removed from uh, that, that grouping. Uh, but the purpose of that is to get you to a list of, of two finalists, if you will, if no one gets six votes. Uh, and then you will, uh, again, vote on uh, those, those finalists and um, and if someone gets six votes uh, at that stage, uh, that person will be uh, the, the um, uh, will fill the vacancy. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can make motions on the top two vote getters as well uh, to get to that um, uh, to fill that vacancy uh, going forward. Um, 
This is done by the 10 of you. Um, if there is a tie vote, the mayor is authorized uh, to break uh, the tie vote, and that's consistent with uh, your charter, rules of procedure, and, uh, and state law as well. And, um, and this is a process that you all need to agree to uh, and discuss, and, uh, and I'll stop there and, uh, uh, and, and take any questions you may have. All right. Are there any questions for the city attorney? Ms. Watlington. Okay, Ms. Watlington. Uh, yes, I don't have a question. I just want to go on record to let folks know that I do that I am not comfortable at all with how we've gotten to this place as we talk about a process. I can't know. hear you, Ms. Watlington. Can you lean in a little bit more? Can you hear me now? Yes, that's much better. Okay, I said I just want to go on record with this council that I'm uncomfortable with how we got to this place. Uh, we talked about how to um, how to work through the applications, but we have not until today at about 3.30 really spoke about the process with which we were going to follow tonight that would be any different or any addition to what was sent via email. Um, so for me, I'm very uncomfortable with the, uh, with the way this came together. Um, I would be inclined to defer this until we aligned, as I've mentioned to several people over the last several days, but I just would like to be clear that I don't expect that we continue to operate in this way. People are getting calls within the hour of a meeting about how a process would be that we're expected to be voted on. I believe that we give each other the courtesy of not adding things to the agenda that will need to be voted on without having a lot of heads up. So for those of us that are working late into the afternoon to then be to be given a process to review and affirm at the last minute, I think we can do better. That's all. All right, Ms. Watlington, I really apologize. I thought that the memo that the city attorney spent, sent prior to this meeting indicated a process by which we would follow and the nominations process. And that this it this afternoon, not the degree I'm sorry, of I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't interrupt. I would like to be able to speak without interruption. I'm sorry, over here there was a delay. It sounded like you were finished. No, oh, well, I'm, I wasn't. So what I was saying basically is that I thought that there was an earlier memo and that we had had this discussion. However, I do say that we off, we, I, when we are having the agenda review at every, every Monday before, we actually go through this in detail so that I am certain to follow the legal and the procedural requirements upon the advice of the city attorney. And so this afternoon, the what you received was something that I requested that he send to you just so that you know the procedures in more detail following my meeting with him. Now we meet every Monday for every meeting all the time. It's on my calendar. Anyone's invited to attend, but it's really just basically around the idea that I make sure that you are aware of what the procedures and how I speak to them and that they are consistent with the city attorney's rulings, especially in this case. So I apologize if that was not very clear. Sometimes I may assume that um, people are aware of these meetings, but I would hope that you understood that this is an mm -hmm. attempt to have the ability for everyone to participate in this process. Madam Mayor. Yes. With all due respect, I've never been invited to that meeting. Well, so I'm, I, not, I'm, saying I'm not saying which. Okay. With yes. all due respect, I've never been invited to that meeting. So if it is a public meeting that we're all invited to, that's new information. I was aware that it happened. Secondly, if this is a decision that the council is to make, again, I would appreciate a heads up and time to actually review a process before I need to vote on it, legal or otherwise. So I believe that the process that we are looking at is the process that we usually use for, um, have used in the past for the vacancy, as well as the process we use for board and commission nominees. So with that, um, excuse me, I'd like to respond. Um, I spoke with the city attorney very briefly earlier, and he indicated that people were not wanting to do what was previously done in 2017. So I, I, I disagree that that's the same process. It's also not the same process we use for boards and vacancies, but that's all. I, I just wanted to be on record. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Newton. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would agree with Council uh, Member Watlington. I, I, I think that, that this procedure was hastily thrown together without full input from all uh, of our uh, of the council. I, I, I guess my question. So I have two questions. My first question uh, revolves around 
uh, the, the process of nomination, I know, so, so it's common knowledge that I applied for John Autry's vacant seat years ago. I believe that's probably the 2017 uh, vacancy that was uh, referenced earlier. And in so doing, I know that there was a process whereby there was a nomination in a needed second to, uh, to, to have the nominated candidate proceed to a vote. And uh, it's my understanding that that is customary, um, something that, that, uh, that certainly uh, leads to an expedited process and fewer rounds of voting. So I, I just want to ask the, the initial question pertaining to that, uh, why has that seemingly uh, arbitrarily changed here? And then secondly, also ask the more uh, specific question pertaining to uh, the tie break. And I know that this is something that uh, that we have, a, uh, we as a council have have discussed amongst ourselves. But I would just like to have a little bit more clarification pertaining to uh, whether the tie break is mandatory or within the discretion of the mayor. And, and those are both questions for the city attorney, Mr. Baker. You've heard the two questions. Would you? I, I have, and I spent uh, myself, along with uh, Deputy City Attorney Olivia James, uh, spent a good bit of time. Uh, with both um, former city attorneys, Matt McCarley and Bob Hageman, uh, over the weekend uh, and have asked them a number of questions over the course of the last couple of weeks so that I had a clear understanding, given the fact that it's, the process is not baked into your charter or, uh, or any other document, uh, to try to find out exactly how things have been done. Uh, and, and what I have been heard, I have not heard about the nomination in second uh, piece, what I uh, what I've been explained to was exactly what I put in my memo, which is council goes through a round of nominations uh, and then ultimately votes on those nominees to get to a top two uh, and then re-votes on those nominees uh, to, uh, to try to get to six votes uh, with the mayor uh, in, the, in the place um, uh, being able to break a tie if there's a tie among the last uh, two votes. The historic advice uh, from this office has been that the mayor uh, has a vote, um, uh, but is not required to vote. I've had conversations with uh, with both attorneys uh, about the the source of that um, that that advice, and um, I, I believe that that. And I've recommended and I've not changed uh, the fact that the mayor has the option uh, to vote. I do have uh, my my thoughts about what the charter says uh, versus what the state law says. Uh, but the way that you read uh, Chapter 160A and the state law basically says that that the city can opt uh, going with the general statute um, or the, the charter uh, in those areas where they talk about the same uh, issues. So although it would be my recommendation that the mayor vote, um, I'm not prepared to say that it's mandatory given the fact that it's not absolutely clear uh, in the charter uh, as to uh, the issue of, of voting. But I did want to make the council aware that it has been the historic advice from this office that the mayor can break a tie but is not required to. And I would assume that's why you use the language the mayor is authorized uh, before uh, because it, it is optional and uh, within the mayor's discretion. Uh, not something that's mandated or or subject to the language of shall, uh, and, and and I would just like to to, to renew my uh, my objection to to moving forward in a process that seems so much longer and protracted than it needs to be, uh, where we don't have uh, these seconds uh, to nominations. I believe that that is what we have traditionally done, and it just seems somewhat unorthodox for, uh, in, in my opinion, for us not to do that. Um, so just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. No, I took my hand down, Mayor. Okay. All right. Um, I. Mayor, Miss Ashmira. Miss Ashmira. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I wanted to address Miss Watlington's question. Um, so, Miss Watlington. Uh, what are concerns you have with the process? What, what do you, I guess, what changes do you have? That's my concern, Deputy Clerk Councilmember Ashmira, is that there was not enough time to review it to even suggest changes. My concern is not even specific necessarily to the process. My concern is that I have not had an opportunity to review it. Are you referring to the memo that was just that was sent this afternoon? 
Uh, well, I didn't receive a memo this afternoon until I was already logged into this WebEx. I was referring to the um, text message that I received about three, or voicemail text that I received about 3.30, about 3.30. Mr. Driggs, I'm sorry, Ms. Ashmira, were you done? I don't want no, to stop I, you. Yes. No, I'm just, so I guess the timing is an issue here, not necessarily the process. I guess the communication was was uh, too close to our meeting. Is that, am I hearing that right, Ms. Watlington? What I'm saying is I can't tell you if there's a process problem because I did not have time. To review it. I understand. I think Ms. Watlington brings a valid concern about not having an opportunity to review the process or not even having enough time before the meeting. And I, I think that's something we can easily address. Um, so thank you. All right, Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to say, I think the process the city attorney has outlined can lead us in, in a fairly expedited fashion to a good result that reflects a majority view on council. Um, and the issue of whether or not the mayor may or must vote really only arises if your view is that she must vote and she chooses not to. So un only under those circumstances would we have to address that question now. Uh, and otherwise, I, I really recommend to everybody that we not overwork this thing and get down to the business of talking about the candidates. Uh, I, I think we'll find that uh, each individual council member's view can be aired and will be apparent and that, uh, uh, that we should be able to reach a conclusion. So I just hope we can proceed. Thank you. All right. Any other comments from the council? No, ma'am. All right, so my understanding is that um, this is an agenda item that's on the agenda. We have the ability to um, look at what's in the legal and procedural overview. If there are modifications to it, or I believe it says, um, it makes, it says the several times voting may be conducted using the same process. It says if a nominee receives two votes, is there a change in the process? So that this is now, um, as I would say, up to the council. Um, do I have a motion to um, change any of these items that have been provided by the attorney that, do not re that are procedural and not legal? All right, I hear no hands are raised. Mr. Newton? Yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll put it to vote. I'll make a motion to amend uh, these uh, procedures to require a second to a uh, nomination uh, once nominations have opened um, and, uh, and ask for a second for that in a vote. All right, I have Mr. Graham. We would, and, and you're suggesting that we'll come back. Let me just go to, is there a second to requiring a second for a nomination? Second. All right, Ms. Johnson did that. So that's our first motion for a change. Mr. Graham. Uh, I didn't have my hand up. All right. Any other suggestions for changes to the procedure as listed? Um, Mr. Winston. So, <clears throat> it's, it's, it, I, I'm not totally, uh, one, I would like an explanation to Mr. Newton's uh, uh, motion, uh, because naturally every motion needs a second to proceed, correct? Yes, yeah, so Ms. Um, Ms. Johnson's made the second. Was the second. <laughs> and we haven't but, had discussion on the motion yet. Okay. Well, uh, so I would like to say one thing um, uh, uh, about the process, um, which I do uh, think is missing. Um, we had, did have a great um, conversation. Um, uh, we heard from our, uh, the candidates on Friday, 60, about 63 of them, if I'm correct, 63 or 68, I forgot. 68. Um, but they're 68. Um, 
And here we are at the point where we are about to consider um, nominees, um, but we have not had the ability uh, to have a conversation amongst ourselves about potential candidates. Um, we have not had any type of form. There is no arena or process uh, for the city council um, to actually come together um, and discuss what we heard as a community on Friday and the, the, the vast amounts of, of reading um, for those folks out there. Uh, we received this uh, uh, binder um, with information about um, each candidate and, and their very careful responses. And we haven't had uh, a venue to um, caucus uh, around this process. So um, if there was one change in this, I, I believe that we're missing a caucus step um, where we are able to uh, have uh, conversations, potentially have straw votes, sort of like how we do with the budget process that we're about to go into. And I think the community, um, at, as, as well as this council and our, our government and democracy, um, could be well served uh, if we did have a caucus step in this process. So I, I would make a motion. I don't know exactly what that means. I'm not an expert um, at, 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 at procedure. Um, so while I would like to make a motion if we're considering a, a caucus step, I would need some help from um, the experts that we have perhaps in staff um, to, to explain what, what that step would actually look like so, so it makes sense to everybody. So I, I don't know if that, I don't know if that uh, question is, is directed to me or not. And, and I don't know if, it, if a motion has actually been made. Is that a question where you're asking? I have, I would make a motion. I, yes, you consider me that a motion. Um, and I would, I would like, yes, if you are the expert that can provide some um, advice on that step, yes, it's directed to you. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that, that I'm the, the expert on, on what you mean by, by caucus. I'm assuming that that's a conversation that you want your colleagues to have about, about discussions of, of the applicants. Well, again, we have, we have this step in the budget process, right, where we all make recommendations and we come together for a straw vote um, and, we, will, and, we, and we, we bounce ideas off of each other. It's not an official vote, so we have this step within our, our normal um, practices and, and, and processes, so it's not anything that we are, uh, as an institution or organization, um, unaware of, um, but it just has not been inserted into this appointment process. So um, I, would, I would like to add that step. Um, to the appointment process if we're considering changing processes at this point in time. Um, but I would need help from you guys to properly verbalize. Mr. Uh, Mr. Winston, can I just add something to your comment? And then I think Mr. Baker will have to address it. I think when we're doing the budget, what we're doing is giving direction to the manager to prepare the budget. In this case, I'm not sure how you give direction to each other. And so I, I don't know how, I, I, think you're, I think that the question would be, as a caucus, um, how do we do that? And I don't know in how we do that because generally that straw vote that we have during the budget is because the budget has to be put together in this huge document that's re statutorily required for an ordinance. In this case, we're actually voting among ourselves for something, but I'd, I'd then turn it over to Mr. Baker or, or any other comments from the council members about caucusing. Mr. Baker? Yeah, so so j just to make sure that you all understood, I, we provided you a timeline back in on, on January the 15th, and, and everything has occurred pursuant to that timeline, uh, which I believe uh, was adopted uh, on January the 15th. So uh, from my perspective, you know, what, what's, what's on the table today uh, is, is we're at the February 1 date where uh, you are to uh, vote on the um, on, on the vacancy, uh, and this is the process of determining the process by which you're going to vote is happening here. So um, I, I don't know that I have anything to say about the caucusing uh, aspect of it since it wasn't included uh, in the in the timeline that's been adopted by the city council. So you want to work on your thoughts about a motion, Mr. Winston? And I think we have one motion on the table to require a nomination to have a second, and I'm going to call on the mayor pro tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, 
I, com I completely agree with Mr. Winston that it would really be beneficial for the council to talk to each other, but we didn't. <laughs> I sent a text message to everybody Saturday morning and that the media can look at it saying, you guys, we've got to come up with a process. This is a council process. The man, the, as it was noted, the attorney gave us a process, but, but we have to come up with a process. I had one person respond to say, call me after 5 p.m. And I have been on the phone consistently since Saturday morning. And nobody, you know, one council member said we need a process. If not, we need to defer and then posted their, their choice. You know, I, I mean, I said to a couple council members, absolutely, if you guys want to defer because you can't get there, there yet, this is really hard. Nobody anticipated we would have a hundred and some choices to choose from of really good choices. We just, that hasn't happened before. And I asked you guys that if you wanted to defer, let's do that on Sunday so we wouldn't get here to Monday night and have everybody hanging like this. And nobody said, all right, let's go ahead and defer. So you guys, we've got to be willing to talk to each other and not disparage each other. We have to act as a council. We, we have got a process. It's a process that we did talk about at three o'clock in the agenda meeting, which is an agenda meeting that happens every Monday before a council meeting with the manager, the mayor, the city attorney, the clerk, and myself. And other council members, if they're in the building, they drop in. It's just something that's always been standard. That's when we solidified this process. I sent you all out the process. Some people didn't agree with it, but I don't know that delaying it in a pandemic is gonna get us a different result. We've got to all be willing to do more work together and make more of an effort in a pandemic. But I don't know what caucusing means. I asked the city attorney, can we get together in groups of three or four? And he wasn't sure that that was something we should do. And so I didn't propose that. Um, and we had to talk to each other on the phone and I've called everybody at least once. So we are where we are with this process. I don't know what it's gonna get us if we wait any longer. I think it's unfair to all these people who have applied, who are probably watching us now. Um, if you know how you're gonna vote, everybody has their own reasons for voting the way they're gonna vote and I think we should all respect that. This is hard. I've been, this is my third time going through it. It doesn't get any easier. And that's just, that's all I have to say about this. All right, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I believe, um, so I will respond to council member um, Winston's question. Uh, the process, which uh, it's a traditional process, uh, something that in, in every other uh, instance of uh, uh, you know, every instance where I've been involved in filling a vacancy or frankly making decisions in the past where you have uh, a motion or in this case a nomination that gets seconded. It's, it's what the council clearly has done before, by the way. But the whole idea is to go ahead and narrow down the field uh, preliminarily to expedite the process that you're eventually going to arrive at anyway. And uh, I, I think also it makes this entire process less painful, frankly, for everyone too. So that's why uh, I would recommend that we stick with tradition, right? That hasn't uh, done us wrong in the past here and uh, have nominations with seconds so that we can go ahead, narrow down the field, look at the candidates that really have that initial support and move them uh, directly to vote. And frankly, uh, I, I think maybe get through this in, in one round rather than two or three. All right, um, Mr. Graham. You're on mute, Mr. Graham. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I think we know where we are, and I'm not sure the discussion over the last 30 minutes will change where we're going. Obviously, the process, and I didn't receive the memo, um, uh, but I trust the people in the room that laid out the process. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, there's trust there that we're all trying to do the right thing. And so I, I, I'm, I, I think we know where the candidates are been whittled down. We know who they are. And, and I think we, we're doing the community such a disservice um, by not just getting on with it. 
uh, and doing what we have to do and, and let the votes fall where they may. Uh, I make a motion to nominate Joe S Smith. I hope that that would get a second. That's pretty basic <laughs> without having to take a vote on it. Um, and we basically already whittled the candidates down. Um, everyone knows who they want to support or not support. And I just think we ought to just get on with it. All right, Ms. Watlington. I was just going to say, um, <laughs> I, I, I can appreciate the sentiment of Councilmember Graham, and I was actually thinking that that's exactly how we were going to go through it, given that um, this has been done before, right? And so to bring up changes at the, again, what I believe and still feel is the last minute, I think is unnecessary. Uh, I think, though, that Mr. Winston has a great point. Uh, I think that highlights that whatever we discussed before was about the applicant process, which is very different than what we're talking about today. It's clear from this conversation, some people didn't even get information, it's clear from this conversation that we're not in a position to pivot from whatever we normally do. And so I, there is a motion on the floor, so I'm going to call the question. All right, we have a motion for a second on the, um, all right, we're going to, um, can we do, is this discussion or comment, Mr. Winston, related to the motion? Because we've had a call for the question. Okay, um, I make a substitute motion. Um, all, right, all right, Mr. Winston has a substitute motion. So I'm going to uh, make a substitute motion uh, that we put on the agenda, a caucus meeting. And I will give you the definition of a caucus. A caucus is a very basic political um, uh, 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 process. It is a meeting at which local members of a political party register their preference among candidates running for office or select delegates to attend a convention. That is the type of meeting that we have not had um, together. We are at the point where we are at a, a meeting to select the next person, but we have not had a meeting where we can discuss um, the candidates um, and, and, and talk to each other uh, about um, the, the, the priorities that we have as individuals and as a council and why each each uh, are, are, are the, the consider the considered candidates here. Yeah, but I have a motion and I, I can just, um, talk about it more if it gets second and we go to discussion. So is there again, so before, my motion is, wait a minute before we have a motion that's been called by Mr. Newton first and then Mr. Winston, we come back to yours. So someone thinking about seconding Mr. Winston after we deal with Mr. Newton's procedural motion. Um, Mr. Winston has suggested a second one. They're not, um, they're not the same motion, or it's not a substitute for what Mr. Newton said, I believe. But I just want to check. Mr. Newton was about seconds for nominations. Mr. Winston's is to have a separate meeting of everyone to discuss. So I, I think those are two separate motions. They're not tied together. Am I correct yeah, in I that? Have made, I have made a substitute uh, motion for that just to, to supersede uh, Mr. Newton's motion if it gets a second. Okay, I need some help, Mr. Baker. Does Mr. Winston's motion come align no. with Mr. Yeah, no, I, 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 I hear you. I, I think that those are separate motions um, that, that one doesn't negate the other. Uh, Mr. Newton, has uh, made a motion to add to the process uh, that, that the nominations uh, require a second. Um, and I would say that Mr. Winston's uh, motion is separate from Mr. Newton's, so I don't see it as a substitute. Um, and, and the question here is, is what to add to the process of, uh, that, that you're putting together right now. Um, so I consider Mr. Mo Mr. Um, Winston's motion to be separate and, and not a substitute for Mr. Newton's motion. Objection. All right, Mr. Bakari, I didn't I'm just know kidding, I'm just kidding. Continue on. Oh, thank you. I appreciate thank that. Thank you for that, Tariq. <laughs> All right, Tariq. Okay, I thought I was for a moment really being Judge Judy here. So I'm gonna stop that. And so um, we have a call for the question on Mr. Newton's motion to call to ask in the procedure that's included in the information that you received to require a nomination to have a second. All right, we're gonna have a roll call vote. Um, and actually, because this, is, this changes um, every week, Mr. Newton, 
Um, we have a motion by Mr. Newton, a second by Ms. Johnson. And so, Mr. Newton, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Watlington, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem, how do you vote? No. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? I'm not sure what's going on, so I'm going to say no, but we'll see. Mr. Driggs? No. Mr. Eggleston? No. Ms. Graham? Mr. Graham, sorry. Mr. Graham? Yes. We're second on the nomination. Uh, Ms. Johnson? Yes. That motion passes, so we'll add that to the procedures tonight. All right, the second motion that was made um, by Mr. Winston was that we um, add to the schedule, which would mean that we would not be doing this tonight, a caucus meeting by the council to discuss. So can, um, may I ask a question Mr. of Mr. Baker about the caucus meeting? What are the requirements sure. for the council to have a meeting of notification to the public and to the media? That is correct. You would have to, it would be a, um, based on what I'm understanding uh, is, is the question uh, that you would, it, it would be a, uh, an open meeting, which would require notice to the public, yes. Okay. So do, is there a second to Mr. Winston's motion? Hearing no second, um, the motion um, will not be brought for a vote to the council. All right, so now we're back at the procedures. We've amended the procedures that have been sent to you by legal and procedure. I um, have put together for my notes um, the next step in this process. So I'm gonna go ahead and proceed with that as mayor opening the floor for nominations to fill an at-large vacancy. I would recognize council members for nomination and the council member nominations must have a second. And I'm going to ask our city attorney and deputy city attorney to keep track of that so that we can be in order. The clerk has enough to do by tracking it that we are able to um, historically keep the record. And um, so I would now recognize council members for nominations. Mr. Winston. Excuse me, Madam Mayor, my hand is up. I was I, trying to get to her screen. Ms. Her hand Ms. is up. Ms. Jackson is getting it after Mr. Winston. Mr. Winston. His hand's not up. Okay, Mr. Winston, he said, I'm sorry. Ms. Watlington. So, <laughs> praise God. Um, first, I really just want to take this time to sincerely thank everybody that put in an application and put their name in the hat for this. This is important work. I love, love, love the momentum and the excitement and frankly the candidates that we saw there are so many people that we had an opportunity to get to know a little bit better um, that we may have never been able to even see so i just want to thank you for that um, i would just want to highlight a few of the names that came out there were a, a lot of up and coming talent that i saw and a few that i really really um, was impressed by and some i've even had an opportunity to make some connections with some community organizations because i think that's a role for everybody to play um, and i sincerely am committed to helping folks get connected where they can get, gain more experience. Um, Ryan McGill, Dante Anderson, Becca Wilden, Maritza Ortiz, Dr. Anthony Andrews, all of them were phenomenal among others. Um, and so I'm very hopeful that we have a bright future in our hands. If people are given the opportunity, I think we can take Charlotte Farr. So I'm going to start the process and I hope that my colleagues support me in um, allowing one of those new talents on this council uh, by nominating Jessica Davis. Second. Council Member Newton, second. Thank you, Mr. Newton. And Madam Mayor, Mr. Graham has Mr. To Graham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, also thank all the applicants who submitted their application for, for public service. I, I think the volume of applications really demonstrates um, the commitment that people have for public service in our community. Uh, and it also gives us a roadmap for over 140 citizens for appointments to board and commissions, um, where, in my opinion, some of the real work really gets done in terms of how we move 
our city forward. So uh, I think we not only do we have a number of great applicants, but we also have uh, um, a number of opportunities for them to participate in public service. So I want to thank them for that. Um, this is a, is a trying time for our community. And as you can see um, by the discussion tonight, uh, this seat that we feel is really important. Um, it's important to build um, council cohesiveness in a number of efforts, in a number of fronts. Uh, and I believe that based on that, um, and that we really need to identify someone who can really, really hit the ground running, uh, I put forth the nomination of Gregory Phipps um, to fill the at-large council seat. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Eggleston. All right, are there other nominations for the council? Mr. Winston? Mr. Winston, we can't hear you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so again, I would like to point out to the public uh, that your city council uh, has not discussed the merits of uh, the applicants uh, that came before us on Friday. Um, a couple years ago, uh, there was a, a, a very, uh, uh, I, I thought, important uh, process this community went on. Um, and the Chetty study produced a leading on opportunity task force report. And one of the main takeaways of uh, that report that many organizations and entities and governments um, signed on to uh, was that we are uh, a city, an equitable city, 50 out of 50, um, because of uh, traditions of institutions. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, systems uh, that 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 we are an inequitable city because of this consolidation of social capital amongst the haves and the have-nots, uh, and we know that this is not just um, uh, the, this the consolidation of social capital it does not just happen in white Charlotte. It also happens in black Charlotte. It also happens. Um, and it happens in the Crescent, and it happens in the Wedge. Uh, and what we are experiencing um, is the perpetuation of uh, that consolidation of social capital um, tonight uh, by the Charlotte City Council. Um, I, I think what the community is feeling out there is true, um, is that these, uh, uh, these two candidates uh, that are the only two candidates that are going to be uh, nominated tonight um, for the most part, um, have been preconditioned. Um, I am applying. I went into Friday very objective, uh, um, and I applied two principles. Uh, and I had a conversations with all of my colleagues individually this week, and basically um, told um, just about all of them the same thing. Um, um, you know, I will not support anybody who did not come before the people and plead their case on Friday. Um, while the 10 of us uh, have uh, the awesome responsibility of being able to choose the next rep representative for nearly a million people, um, it, it should not just be about our prerogative. Uh, the person that uh, 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 should fill that seat should, should come before uh, the people that they represent uh, and plead their case. Uh, Greg Phipps did not on Friday. Um, I am all, the other principle that I have uh, is uh, you know, is, is, is my love for democracy um, and the insertion, when you insert yourself, as we all have, the, the 10 and 11 of us in this room, uh, to the democratic process, you put yourself up. Um, uh, you put yourself up. And, and so I will not select anybody uh, who was not able uh, to uh, make it through a Democrat, failed uh, to make it through a Democratic primary. Um, that means I will not support uh, Ms. Davis, uh, as she ran a very well-organized um, campaign uh, uh, that was highly supported um, and, 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 and was, was really well done. But in the end, uh, the people did not select her. Uh, but, you know, she has consolidated uh, some pretty strong uh, 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 political and social capital. And, and that, that's where this nomination um, ha has come from. Uh, so I, I, I believe that, you know, as I applied those principles, there were four people that
that I would love to have a conversation with, namely Dante Anderson, uh, Terry Lansill, uh, Maritza Ortiz, uh, and Rebecca Wilden. Um, I am saddened uh, that we will not be able to have, and then the, the, our constituents will not be able to hear us um, have a, a really true uh, conversation uh, based on merit, uh, based on fact, um, and, 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 and based on uh, the agenda that we have set forth. Um, more importantly, I'm saddened uh, that we will once again uh, miss an opportunity of changing the status quo um, and, and being the example for all of our community partners um, that we go to time and time again and ask them to change their operations uh, to make this a more equitable community. I will not be participating um, in, in, in this process, um, so I wish uh, my nine other colleagues uh, good luck tonight um, in, in, in explaining this uh, to our constituents. Thank you very much. I don't know if you're speaking in the room, but you, you might be muted. Sorry, thank you. It's, I was trying to eat some lunch, the dinner, I guess. Um, so the, um, are there other nominations? Uh, just a point of, point of order question, since we've changed the, not, uh, the procedure a little bit on the fly. Um, if, is it possible if Councilman Winston wanted to nominate another person just so we could have more of that discussion that he wants to have, I've told him last night that I'd be prepared to at least second Rebecca Weldon to get into that conversation. I just am unsure what that, if that means I'm locking in a vote there, or is that, Mr. Baker, does that mean it would just be something that would at least now add another name into the conversation? Because certainly, you know, while that, while that, um, that, that process should have happened over the, the weekend or offline amongst the members, um, I'm more than willing to help that along if it doesn't hurt anything right now. Yes, uh, Councilmember Bakari, uh, a second, uh, if a motion comes and you second it, that is not tying you to a vote. Uh, it is simply uh, truly just seconding uh, the motion for that person to be uh, in consideration as a nominee. So, Mr. Winston, I'll stand by that um, offer that I made you last night on one of your four that you identified. But Ms. there would need Mayor to be a Pro motion. Tim, I, okay, we have... Mr. Bakari was asking Mr. Winston a question. Mr. Winston, do you have a response? Oh, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, do you have a nomination? I know, let me just say, we're gonna, after we have the nominations, we'll close the nom nominations and have further discussion of the nominees. So there'll be an opportunity to talk about those that have been nominated as well following this. So are there any other nominations? Mayor Pro Tem? No, ma'am, if we do not have further nominations, I would move to close the nominations. All right, I have a motion to close the nominations. Are there any, do we, we have a second? Second. Mr. Driggs did the second. So on closing the nominations, um, is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, um, we'll begin the roll call vote. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm sorry. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Winston? No. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. All right, the motion to close the nominees, um, close the nominations is approved. Now, the next thing that I wanted, is there any further discussion of the nominees? Would anyone like to talk about either Mr. Um, Phipps or Ms. Davis? Mr. Eggleston. Mr. Graham followed by Mr. Eggleston. I'm sorry, yes, Mr. Eggleston followed by Mr. Graham. Either way is fine. Um, so I, I wanted to, and I won't repeat all of it, but I wanted to echo 
much of what Councilmember Watlington said about um, the appreciation for the folks who put themselves forward. And I do hope that if uh, this wasn't already part of the plan that we will get, I know this has been mentioned by others, that we will get out to all of those applicants um, from the clerk's office information on our advisory boards and committees. I think we've got a enormous pool of talent there um, that we can get more plugged in with the work of the city. Uh, I do think there were a lot of, of people who would make excellent council members now and in the future. And I hope that they'll continue to, to pursue that. Um, for me, with all the things that we've got on our plate this year, uh, the ability to literally hit the ground running on day one, I think one out for me. Um, it's, it's not an indictment of anyone else's qualifications because many of the people that have already been mentioned and others uh, are incredibly highly qualified, incredibly good people, um, understand the work that we do, but there's no substitute for having done the work. Um, we all, I think, came in with a certain level of preparation to be on council, and regardless of how prepared you are, there is a learning curve. Uh, in a different year, I think that learning curve might be less of a burden, but in a year where we've got uh, some of the things that are in front of us for the year 2021, um, I think that extra time that someone will have uh, by already knowing and already having done the job is, is critical. So that's that's how I felt on that, but I, I do greatly appreciate the people who put themselves forward. Uh, I was blown away by, the, uh, by how many impressive folks spoke to us on Friday, and I hope that we will continue to find ways to engage them in the work of this city government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eggleston. Um, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I just want to speak to the nomination of Greg Phipps as well. Um, I, the first thing for Mr. Phipps is that he's made a commitment, while it's not a requirement, not to run for the seat um, this fall. And I think that's really important for the 142 applicants, for those who really want to run for the Charlotte City Council and get the vote of the people versus 10 council members, there will be an open seat. And I think that's a really um, credible point to make. What we saw earlier today on the same discussion for 30 minutes is why I think we need someone who can bring some cohesiveness to this council, who understands the role of the city council member, which is to operate at a 30,000 feet, not get caught in the weeds, someone who knows our rules and our procedures of operating, uh, and someone who's been accustomed to being on council to move us forward. We've got to be a lot more effective and efficient. So if we're going to add someone to the mix, we need to add someone who has some experience, some know-how, who understands our rules and procedures, who can make sure that our meetings are effective and efficient on day one. And of all the applicants, I believe Mr. Fitz can do that. He served as four years as a member of the Planning Commission, so there will be no learning curve in terms of planning and zoning. He can come in on day one and be an effective member relating to all the zonings that we're doing every month. He can speak to that right away. Uh, he served for six years as chairman of our budget committee. And as the budget chairman said, that that process really begins for us on Wednesday of this week. Mr. Fisk can come in and know the budget, know the line items, understand how it works, how we can move the city forward, and really talk on day one intelligently about the budget. Because again, for six years, he served as chairman of the budget committee. And lastly, he also chaired the transportation committee. And as you know, there's a major transportation initiative that the council will be debating uh, and, and going through all year long. He also represented the council as a member of the CR T um, Temple Committee, regional representative. And if we're gonna get this referendum on the agenda uh, for a referendum in November, regional cooperations will be extremely important. He has those relationships with his towns uh, to talk about our goals and objectives as a community relating to, to transportation. He can do that on day one. And let me repeat the first thing I said. He won't run for the seat this fall. So there will be an open seat. Individuals who are interested in serving a city council will have the opportunity without someone 
who we anoint that will have the power of incumbency. That will not be there. He made that word to me. I trust Mr. Phipps on his word. So that seat will be open. And again, our goal, our objective is just not to um, fill the seat, but it is to provide uh, a, a, an individual who can help us with our council being a lot more effective, efficient, bring us together on decision making, who understands our rules or procedures. I mean, so we can, you know, move on in doing the business of the city without experiencing turbulence every council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I first want to say that I would be absolutely honored to work with both of these candidates. It, 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 with either one of them or with a number of the other people that did apply, I sort of, um, as I said, I spent the entire weekend working on this. And at some point I pivoted and I started calling community members and said, don't tell me what candidate you're supporting, tell me what we need. Because there is a reason that we appoint a vacant seat versus go through in, going through a whole election again. It's very different to go through an election versus appointing somebody. This is my third time doing this. And so when I called council members, a lot of them reflected on how difficult it's been to manage through a pandemic. And they reflected on what we've got coming up ahead of us, that being a vote in the next 10 months on the Unified Development Ordinance, the Comprehensive Vision Plan, the strategic the funding for a strategic mobility plan in the form of a possible referendum for a mobility tax. We also have, which I can't believe hasn't hit the radar more for people, a possible referendum on four-year terms for council. Um, and in the meantime, we have, you know, little things like trying to, trying to continue to work on creating affordable housing in our community and trying to get our homicide rate down. All of those issues are issues that did not come up in the past couple of months. We've been working really hard with it. I know that for myself, in my fifth year on council, I feel like I'm better understanding these things. And it's very difficult to jump in midstream, especially two weeks before we're starting our budget process. So I think the volume of candidates that applied and their talents brought out two things for me. Is one, we gotta figure out why more of these people don't run for council. What is it that prevents some of these people with this incredible talent and skill sets from running for a city council seat? And I offer myself to anyone who wants to find out how to run for city council and would like some advice. Um, I've had those on council before me did that for me and I absolutely offer that because we need good people to sit on city council. And so with that, I am, I am leaning towards voting on somebody that can come into this job and get up and to speed quickly, take the reins and keep running. Because we also know that in a couple of months, right, as soon as we're done with our budget process, the council is all gonna be running for election. And the staff can tell you it's a whole different ball game and people kind of disappear. So we've got a lot of important work ahead of us. And I really am very grateful to the people who put themselves out there to, um, to run for this process. All right, Mr. Newton. Madam Mayor, I uh, would like to preliminarily echo the, the comments of uh, Council Member Watlington and Council Member Eggleston uh, to, to thank all of the, the candidates. Uh, this was uh, a tremendously difficult decision to make because we did have so many qualified, uh, excellent candidates uh, that can uh, or would have the opportunity and ability to to uh, jump on the ground floor running here uh, as soon as uh, appointed. Um, now, in making my decision who to support, uh, I wanted to pay close attention to those individuals who took the process seriously and putting the effort in time. Uh, those are the folks that exhibited that they truly cared. And as a preliminary matter, uh, displaying that effort was important to me. Uh, I felt like it takes that effort to put in the work day in and day out to successfully contribute on this council. And uh, most of the applicants and candidates did just that, but not everyone. I, I also felt like it was important to look towards the future. Uh, we need fresh ideas and approaches uh, on our city council. Uh, we know that the policies of the past aren't working for everyone, that the status quo isn't working for everyone, and it's time to move forward. 
Uh, there are many energetic and intelligent candidates that certainly fit that bill, uh, bringing a real depth of knowledge along with them. Uh, and finally, I thought it was important to respect the voice of the outgoing elected council member. And no, I don't just mean that from the standpoint of the recommendation, because although I did appreciate council member Mitchell's recommendation, uh, due to the fact that I have such tre a tremendous amount of respect for him, um, many of my council, uh, my council accomplishments, by the way, would not have been possible but for uh, his guidance, contributions, and support. And I know I'm not the only one uh, who says that, but I also mean uh, the recommendation from the standpoint of, uh, well, the voice from the standpoint of the people that that council member, council member Mitchell represented himself, the voice he provided for those folks. Uh, everyone who has voted for him numerous times over the years, not just as an at-large member, but also as a district representative of that community. Uh, because the most important thing that we do as council members is provide a voice for the people. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Council Member Mitchell grew up right here in, Ch in Charlotte, attending West Charlotte High School, and has been a steadfast voice for the marginalized and underserved community, the residents of West Charlotte. Uh, all of that ultimately drew me to one candidate, and that's Jessica Davis. Uh, Ms. Davis is a resident of the West Side, has a long history of assisting her neighbors with housing and disability matters at the county courthouse. She serves on the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council and has a professional background in strategic planning and budgetary process. As to those last two points, that background would prove very helpful as we enter into the budget season. She also brings fresh ideas to the table not the least of which are fresh ideas pertaining to our COVID-19 response. Finally, Ms. Davis took this process seriously. Among other things, she submitted a thorough application and found the time to speak on Friday. I wanted to finish by saying that it frankly doesn't bother me that Ms. Davis has unsuccessfully run for office before. If anything, I view that as a plus. I wouldn't penalize anyone for exhibiting the willingness to serve and I would in turn hate to discourage anyone from attempting to run for office in the future. Uh, we need more people willing to put themselves out there and give it a go. Uh, so uh, having said that, thank you again for all of the applicants or thank you again to all the applicants, all of the candidates here. Uh, please don't let this be the end of the road for you if you are not selected. Uh, continue to put yourselves out there, give it a go. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, I will be supporting uh, Ms. Davis tonight. All right, Ms. Watlington. Yeah, so a couple of things. I would first like to echo what uh, Councilman Lamine said. All of the things that he mentioned, I took into consideration in regards to my decision. Um, I also went painstakingly through the applications. I also reached out to several of the applicants that made my short list. So please understand that um, I did not reach this conclusion because of social capital. I would argue that the reason that Ms. Davis has such community support is because she's authentic and she's earned it. And I would say that we don't know our own procedures. When we look at the first 30 minutes of this meeting, whether you've been here six years, you've worked at the city for decades, clearly none of us can say we're experts on the procedures. So I, I, I'm not sure that I would expect anybody coming in to be an absolute expert either. We're not hiring a city manager. While I absolutely respect and appreciate council member Fitz's experience, many of the things that was listed there are things that really fall within the responsibility of staff. When we think about our great staff, I feel like regardless, they've got the expertise that they need. What they're looking for, for count, from council is the will of the people. Our role is to be able to articulate the values of the people. And I believe that we've already seen with, um, with great input and volume that Jessica Davis is the will of the people, not only uh, today, but also um, in the previous campaign, we all know, which is part of the reason why some of us do not want to support somebody who is not, uh, in, who is intending to run. We know there is value in incumbency. And with all due respect to Councilmember Graham, he, he had 20 years on. So I would also encourage us to not count somebody out because they put themselves out there and could not get the social capital as quickly um, as someone who, is, who has been more experienced and had name recognition. Uh, that, I think, speaks exactly to what the problem is. Um, when we think about 
uh, what our community has told us. I also uh, had several conversations with members of the community, and I will tell you, with all due respect, not a single member of the community I spoke to asked to bring Greg Fitz back. I'm not saying that he didn't do wonderful work, but I th the, the consensus that I was hearing is that they appreciated him for his service, they supported him in not running again, and they believe that we've already got what we need in terms of experience um, on this council. What we've done in the past has not been working. I'm very, I won't say it hasn't been working. What I mean is that I believe that we can do more. And I think over the last year, particularly with some of the, the uh, newer council members, we've been able to really push policy that has been progressive, but also pragmatic. And I think that if we would work together, the more experienced folks and the new folks, or even just people who have different ideologies, that we would get to even better policy. The problem is a lack of cohesion, as Council Member Graham said. That doesn't come from somebody coming on the table, coming here back to council that's got experience. That comes from a willingness to not be condescending. That comes from a willingness to share information. That comes from a willingness to think about things differently and also to not have your own way. And so all of those things, I think, are very, very important in how we operate this council. Um, and I think that regardless of whoever wins the nomination tonight, we've got to do things differently because it's clear that our issues do stem from a lack of cohesion. Oh, the only other thing that I wanted to mention um, is that Mayor Pro Tem is going, is posed the question as to why people don't run for office. This is exactly why because you can offer yourself, you can give the best effort, you can have community support, you can speak to the issues and the needs of the community and still not be considered because you're not a part of the good old boys club. This is not about our comfort. It's not about being efficient for the sake of being efficient. It's about understanding the needs of the community. And so with that, I will close. And as I've already stated, I will be supporting Jessica Davis. All right, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. My colleagues have pretty much said everything, but I want to say from a unique position as uh, Greg Phipps's successor, I, I do support and uh, appreciate the work that he's done in District 4. Uh, Mr. Phipps guided me. He supported my campaign. He contributed, and I appreciate all that, and, and I think he did a, a stellar job. However, tonight, I'll be supporting Jessica Davis because I do think that we need to move forward instead of re regressing. Um, another thing that I, I wanna speak up for the 142 other candidates that we say that we appreciate their time. A, a vote for Mr. Phipps, in my opinion, uh, says the exact opposite. And all of the qualifications about being a Democrat, 21 and over, um, uh, qualified, none of it does say that you have to be a former council member. So he sets a standard that none of those could have ever met. And I don't think that if we were looking for that qualification as former council members, then that's who we should have opened it up to, former council members, and not had those other uh, individuals give their absolute best to apply for this <coughs> position. Some of them might have taken time off work. We know they rehearsed, we, they were excellent. So to vote for Council Member Phipps, I, I think is, um, is an insult to those who have applied. And I've told another council member, if you've never applied for promotion and given your absolute all to prepare only to be denied due to politics, then you were probably a benefactor of those politics. So I, I think that we really need to consider what we ask the public to do before we make the decision to, to grant this to a, to a point a former council member, although that former council member is is excellent, and and I and I do support him in almost everything except for this tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bakari. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I just wanted to say between the two that we've narrowed the field down on, um, both of them. I mean, I don't need to repeat everything that you guys have said. They're they're both incredibly impressive folks. I've s I sat next to uh, Councilman Phipps uh, for an entire two years, right next to him. He's a known quantity. Um, he is a great leader. He'll hit the ground running. And he, um, 
and he's sneaky funny, which is always a good a good thing to break the ice. Um, but Jessica Davis, I also have to say, um, I don't really know personally, but when people like Angela Ambrose and others personally reach out to you and take their time out of their day to, to vouch for someone, I don't take that lightly either. So rather than talk about those two, I, I like some of my other colleagues, just want to take a second to focus and, and say thank you to the other over 100 other folks. Um, you guys were incredibly impressive. And um, I usually kind of find that moments like that are ultimately the beginning uh, of a political um, adventure, not the end. So um, whether it's Rebecca Weldon and we saw her kind of come out and, and uh, it just was incredibly impressive, um, or a Ryan McGill, someone who has been a known, a bit of a known quantity on the campaign trail, and we've always wanted to see um, serve, uh, or for me personally, Bruce Clark and the work that he's done uh, on the digital divide and things like that. I mean, I'll just say, um, yeah, hopefully this makes you feel a little better because I feel terrible as a Republican that there is this incredible Democrat bench in our city and in our community um, and, you know, I, I just, I, I feel a, a bit of the pangs of jealousy and wishing that we had that kind of bench. So I say that to you in all honesty, that you should feel really good about yourselves, all for having um, gone through that process. Uh, and probably many of you kicking off your, your formal political careers uh, from this point forward. So, so keep up the good work and don't be dissuaded there. And then finally, I just say to my colleagues, um, we've had a really tough year, and I think that's probably the understatement of the year. Um, and funny enough, one of my favorite things through this painful process, as many of them are, has been reconnecting with several of you and talking on the phone um, and, and, you know, just, just chatting. And um, I will tell you that uh, with all the dysfunction and things that we've had going on, it's probably because... I'll just use that as a microcosm that, that I wasn't doing that with you. And I'm sure there are many more instances across this body. So I hope that that for us is the kickoff of something new um, because I truly enjoyed talking to you guys and having those conversations. Um, and I'll just, I'll leave it at that. And I hope that's the recipe that really makes 2021 just a really positive year where we focus on the work and focus on trust amongst each other and teamwork and a, and a, and a shared goal. Thank you. Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> I, I have tremendous amount of respect for all the candidates who reached out and who have applied. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to put your name out there. Uh, and having gone through this process in 2017, I thought it would be easy being on this side. And let me tell you, it's been very challenging. It has been very difficult process to choose one candidate out of 100 plus well-qualified and passionate candidates. Uh, I've talked to almost every candidate who have reached out because that's what my predecessors had done with me. They gave me their 15, 20 minutes of their time. I've talked to over 28 candidates. All the meetings are in my calendar. And I was very impressed with with lot of candidates. Carrie Lansdell, Maritza, Noel, Bruce, Bruce Clark, Rebecca, Kelly, Dante, Deborah, Ryan McGill, and and I can continue to go on. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I have worked with many of these folks. Um, I have seen the impact of their work in the communities and have been friends with many of them. And this de decision has been very difficult because it's hard to say no to a friend. Uh, but this work is about making tough decisions. This work is about making difficult decisions. I've had an honor to work with Mr. Phipps when I was appointed to District 5 uh, before serving as an at-large council member. He was my go-to person for rezoning questions, for process concerns, for budget questions. Uh, personally, I have seen him and his wife, Mrs. Phipps, work at the grassroots level in their neighborhood, have attended their town halls. Uh, in fact, they were my guests at our wedding. And uh, so it was very difficult for me to say no to him. 
Uh, but I had to follow my conscience, and I'll be voting for Jessica Davis as the appointee. And, and Mr. Phipps, if you're listening, I hope our friendship will continue to flourish regardless. Thank you. Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. I think like everybody else on council, I was quite staggered by the level of interest uh, in this appointment. And uh, it was uh, overwhelming. Uh, and frankly, for somebody sitting on council, it was quite humbling uh, to see all of the capable people, the qualified people who are interested in doing this work. And uh, obviously the number of applicants presented a challenge for us. I can tell you, uh, this is the book, and I spent a lot of time over the weekend going through the applications, and I identified a few people that stood out in my mind as being <coughs> very qualified <coughs> that might have been uh, my nominee. Uh, in conversations with other council members, it became apparent that uh, some of the people that I had identified were not also people that had been identified by others. So. Uh, the process through which we got to the finalists uh, was not really completely random. I mean, I, I think what we all did is we thought about who we thought the, uh, the potential people were, and we had conversations, and gradually it became apparent that uh, some candidates had the support of numerous council members, and then there were many candidates who had the support of one or, or two council members. So uh, we, we had to go through a process in a very short period of time of arriving at the finalists that we did. And I want to emphasize the fact that uh, the fact that Mr. Phipps, whom I intend to support, emerged was not the result of some political deal or anything like that. Uh, and it, it may seem unfair, but the simple truth is that by virtue of his past service and hard work, he identifies himself as somebody exceptionally qualified to play this role over this period of time. And uh, so, so there's no monkey business about it. Uh, and if he has an advantage, it was hard won. The other thing I will say is uh, uh, I, I, I support Mr. Phipps for all the reasons that Mr. Graham stated better than I could. So I'm not going to repeat it all. His qualifications, his service as chair of the budget committee and of the transportation committee. But I will note, uh, whoever is appointed is going to go in their first full day on the job to a budget workshop. And colleagues, if you remember your first budget process, I think you will agree that it is very hard to take it all in. It's not that hard. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm speaking. I'm just kidding, Ed. I'm sorry. All right, all right. Uh, <laughs> it is, in fact, quite difficult. You've got your enterprise funds, you've got your PAYGO, you've got this, you've got that. And this year, our budget process is particularly critical because we have to populate two bond cycles with uh, CIP projects. And that is something, I think, uh, for which uh, knowledge of how these projects are identified, how we prioritize them, what the available resources are, is going to be particularly important. And then, of course, in the course of the year, we're, we're dealing with some momentous initiatives that will affect the future of the city for decades. And uh, having somebody that can kind of join that conversation and make a contribution right away is important. And I would also note that in general, for a newcomer to council, this is going to be, would be extremely difficult. Uh, and I recognize that having a fresh perspective has value, but really where we are right now, we, we are better off kind of furthering the work that we've been doing than trying to accommodate perhaps new initiatives or new perspectives from somebody who joins. And I think a newcomer that came to council at this point would find that by the time they really felt secure enough to make a difference on council, their term, their, their appointment at least, was up. So uh, I, I have a great deal of respect for Ms. Davis. We haven't met, uh, but I fully expect her 
to be an important figure in public life in Charlotte going forward. I, I really don't think it ends here for her at all by any means. And uh, I do want to express my appreciation for others with whom I spoke or uh, who took the trouble to apply. And again, I think if they persevere, they will find that there are important roles for them here in Charlotte. But uh, just as a practical matter, in order to maximize the effectiveness of council this year, I'm going to support Greg Phipps. Thank you. Thank you. I think everyone on council has had an opportunity to speak except Mr. Winston, who, Mr. Winston, would you like to say anything? All right. So um, now I would need to um, ask council if they're ready to um, make a motion to appoint a member, a nominee to fill the vacancy. Do I need a motion? Yes, Madam Mayor. Oh. Is, oh, uh, I move to appoint Jessica Davis uh, as the uh, replacement uh, or to appoint her as the replacement for Council Member Mitchell. All okay. right. So we have Mr. Newton and then followed by the um, Ms. Johnson for okay. Ms. Davis. So I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that there are no additional questions for the motion. So I'm going to do a roll call vote and um, the, for yes, for Ms. Davis or no. All right. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem. No. Ms. Ajmira. Yes. Mr. Winston. No. Mr. Bakari? No. Mr. Driggs? No. Mr. Eggleston? No. Mr. Graham? No. Ms. Johnson? Yes. That motion fails. Do I have an, an, another motion? But I have a point of order, Madam Mayor. Yes. So, so it was my understanding that, that the way it would work is you have nomination second, and those nominations come forward for a vote on either, and not a separate vote on either, but uh, but a vote for the people in favor of one and the folks in favor of the other. Does that does that make sense? I'm going to so let Mr. Is, Baker address that question. I'm just following the rules the that I were given. I was given a rule, and so Mr. Baker. And, and that was the the assumption that you needed to have a vote to get to the top two. But since only two uh, nominations uh, made it, uh, we've just gone straight with the, the top two. So we've basically saved a vote that wasn't necessary since these were the top two vote getters. Who decided that? I can't hear what Ms. Watlington, what did you ask? Um, who decided that? I don't actually remember us ever um, approving a process, but no worries. That was, that was what we did at the beginning when uh, Mr. Newton uh, submitted uh, his request to add to the process uh, the need for a uh, motion and a, uh, and a, second, a nominee in the second uh, when we put the nominees together. Right. We never said anything about eliminating a round, but it's okay. I just, again, for the record. And I guess the point I'm making here is uh, there appears to be redundancy in this vote because now we're all voting on candidates separately entirely rather than just voting for the candidates that has you know been left over after the nomination that we select and would choose does that make sense and so to the effect of and and i guess really the question then is begged where is if there were ever a tie right what's the point uh in, in having a tie break because if you're voting separately like we are in this fashion that would never occur right so to the extent that, that we are voting here, I think it makes a lot more sense that we would be voting in the affirmative for who we support of the two candidates rather than going through a full, a full vote on each one. So Mr. Newton, I think that what, I, I just wanna be clear in this process is that what you're recommending is, I, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Baker, um, Ms. Lena, Ms. Madam Mayor, can I can I ask Mr. Baker a question? Uh, can I ask Ms. James first a question? Sure. All right, we just took a motion and um, we had a roll call vote. And the question was, 
um, accepting. I think Mr. Newton is raising the question of whether or not that motion should be have been yes for your the person that you choose to vote for. That's what I think that I heard. But, and I'm not sure if how to rule that. So Mr. Baker, you got to help me out here. I'm not sure. I'm trying to see if we re what do we consider from Mr. from Mr. Newton? I uh, understood. Um, and, and what I saw was once you got down to two votes and there were only two nominees, then you just moved forward. But but if you want to go backwards, you can do uh, basically vote for your nominees. So what you would do, Madam Mayor, is is to uh, put the name of Jessica Davis and ask for uh, the positive votes for uh, for Miss Davis. Then put Mr. Phipps out for the positive votes for Mr. Phipps. If, uh, if any of them, uh, and, and that, those are your nominees going forward, and then you would proceed to, to vote uh, to get to those six votes. That's what's on, that's what's precisely on your sheet. Um, but I think uh, with, with moving directly to that particular vote, uh, I, I think you just assume that those are your top two vote getters. So if you take one step back uh, and ask for uh, all in favor of Ms. Davis, those would be positive votes, and then all in favor of Mr. Phipps, those would be positive votes, and then we move forward to, to where we are right now. So you've heard the ruling by the attorney is that we can do it as a favorable vote, and I, um, the, that we can. And so I have Mr. Bakari next. Mr. Bakari? Mr. Baker, could you simply state to us your exact recommendation? And if it's the exact same thing you just said, that's great, as the thing you want us to do and the thing you will defend us in court with afterward, should this become a problem so we can move on? So I, I can I can defend anything, but but to, but, well, let me, let me <laughs> never mind. Let's what's not your, go there. You're not defending today? anything, Mr. Baker. No, no, no. That, I can defend both of those things that you said, Mr. Bakari, is what I'm trying to say when I when I meant uh, when I said anything. Um, but what you have here, uh, if there had been three people, you would have had this particular uh, yes vote going forward. So I recommend uh, that you do what I just said, uh, which is to. To, uh, all in favor of Ms. Davis, all in favor of Mr. Fitz, and then proceed to vote uh, on the nominations. Call the question. All right. I think Ms. Watlington had a question, though. And then Mr. Uh, Newton. Yep. And all I'll say is this, and I'll keep harping on this, John. Um, I appreciate our city attorney for his recommendations, but look. I think we need to be careful about asking for rulings from him. If these are our rules of procedure, then these are our decisions. That's all. Okay. I think the question is, um, do you, Mr. Newton, are you, are you making a motion for a favorable vote? That's what I would, I heard you saying. And, and I just wanted to draw the clarification. I, I understand the complications that are presented with a process like that, or, or, or like what we're going through virtually. But if we were at how it would work, uh, we would ask who are the affirmative votes for. We would raise our hand in the affirmative, count those, and then uh, you know. So for the first uh, nominated person, and then do the same for the second nominated person. And I'm just asking that we stay consistent with that because that's what really makes the most sense here, particularly if. There's uh, this uh, this opportunity or this process whereby a tie break would occur if that you know were to present itself. So that's that's all, right. all I'm saying. Uh, stay consistent with how we would do it if we were in you know, at the diet. So the question that I have is, are you ready? To, would you put that in the form of a motion, Mr. Newton? Or is that appropriate, Mr. Baker? Mr. Baker, is that appropriate? Yeah, what, what you need to do right now, uh, Madam Mayor, is to um, basically you're looking for votes all in favor for uh, Mr. Uh, um, Ms. Davis and then for Mr. Phipps so that you've got counsel on record um, as, vo as voting for these nominations. This is similar to how you would handle your boards and commissions. Okay, is everybody prepared and accepting of that statement? Mr. All right, so let's go. All right, we'll start our roll call again, and you just say your candidate. If you'll say the person that you're supporting, that would be appropriate. Mr. Newton. Yeah, uh, Jessica Davis. Ms. Watlington. Jessica Davis. Mayor Pro Tem. Greg Phipps. Ms. Ajmira. Jessica Davis. Mr. Winston. Mr. Winston. 
All right. Mr. Bakari. Phipps. Miss, yes for whom? Phipps. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. I was, Mr. Driggs. Greg Phipps. Mr. Eggleston. Greg Phipps. Mr. Graham. Greg Phipps. Ms. Johnson. Jessica Davis. All right, Mr. Winston has not voted, and because we're doing it in the affirmative, um, he would be not counted. I, Mr. Baker, how do I deal with that? He is not counted for, for this purpose. All right, so that takes us back to the regular roll call vote that we have to have one, two, three, four, five, four in favor of Mr. Phipps, one, two, three, four in favor of Ms. Johnson. We'll have to go back to the um, roll call vote again by affirmative yes or no for Mr. Phipps. And, and Madam, Madam Mayor, you're at the stage now where we, we just were, where there's now a motion, uh, it would be an order uh, to appoint one of the candidates and then you do the vote, which is what we were just doing uh, before we came back. Move to appoint Greg Phipps. Second. All right. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All right. Roll call vote for Mr. Phipps. Mr. Newton. No. Ms. Watlington. No. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Ajmira. No. Mr. Winston. No. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. No. All right. So in that case, um, three, four, five no's, five yeses. That makes me break the tie. I vote for Mr. Phipps. And that carries six to five. Thank you very much. Okay. I think that's the last item on our agenda for tonight. I appreciate everyone's um, patience as we've gotten through this process. And um, we will have a swearing in for Mr. Phipps tomorrow, and then he will join the budget meetings on Wednesday. Thank Move to you. close. Motion to close. All in favor? Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night.